This is Twit. So, yeah, why? Why now? Like, what's going on here, right? Uh, the last time we saw Panay was back at Build 2023 in May, which I think everyone, whatever one thinks of him, because this guy was, of course, divisive. Uh, some people thought he was the greatest presenter in the world uh, and, a, and a great advocate for Microsoft hardware and software. Others thought he was awkward and weird and, um, you know, you can make your own <laughs> decision on that one. But his uh, his uh, session or his part, his bit of the Build 2023 keynote was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in a Microsoft event ever. He was off kilter. It wasn't just awkward and weird in his normal fashion. It was something was wrong. And um, I eventually, um, I can't say discovered, I, I Based on the information provided by a source, I wrote about it, and we would have talked about it in the podcast, this notion that at the very last minute, all of his news items were taken away from him by Satya Nadella, who wanted to have all the announcements, because this was their big AI kind of coming out party uh, for developers and also for this for strategy. And um, I, my understanding, my belief is that he was supposed to be the one announcing the information about Windows Copilot and everything that was happening on the client. And when you strip that part of his talk out, um, you are left with nothing. And he was, and this guy, you know, again, uh, everyone has their opinions, but the one thing I think is an objective truth is that he was not very good with off the cuff uh, type situations. Um, he needed to be heavily prepared. And even then he was still kind of, you know, weird and awkward. But um, uh, one of the things I am aware of is that, um, you know, this is pre-pandemic because of the timing, but the last two, three, four maybe events that we went to in person where he was speaking, um, he actually brought in fans uh, to sit in front of the journalists because he didn't like the feedback he was getting from journalists. Oh, like we weren't applauding and cheering and you oh, know, whatever. Interesting. Huh. And he needed that kind of thing. And so we were all sitting in the back of the room like, what's going on here? And um, so, you know, it was already getting weird. Um, so that Bill 20. Uh, 2023 appearance was a disaster, no matter how you slice it. And of course, the question you have to ask yourself is, did that have anything to do with this, right? Was that the beginning of, wait, what's going on here or whatever? And right now, my sources are indicating no, <laughs> so that those things had nothing to do with each other. Um, I don't know. Um, so apparently he's landing in Amazon devices. Apparently he's maybe la leading the devices part of that. Um, I have now heard from multiple sources inside Microsoft, executives, employees, former employees, um, about him as happens, right? The, the, the smack talk begins when <laughs> there's no fighting back to be had, right? No pushback. Um, and the consensus on him is kind of what I always thought. Um, uh, a lot of people didn't think he was qualified. A lot of people were not impressed with his, um, so pumped though. accomplishments. Hmm? He was so pumped. Yeah. I don't want to get into this too, too much. I mean, the, the weird thing for me was I had a personal relationship, frankly, with the previous three people who ran windows. Right. And, um, and to varying degrees. I mean, um, Terry Myerson would call me sometimes almost like I was a therapist. You know, um, Stephen Snofsky, who was hot and cold, depending on the day and how much, what he liked or didn't like about what I wrote most recently, was either my best friend in the world or my worst enemy. And he would also send me, he wouldn't call me, but he would send me these incredible 2,000 word emails in the middle of the night, um, <laughs> either ranting or exulting about something. Right. And Panay was nothing. You know, Panay was um, you never an heard outsider. From yeah. He did I, well, steal I'll your, I, I'll he stole your laptop once, right? Yeah, I mean, no, he knew who I was. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, I, I have a few Panay stories, but he, um, you know, you got to remember, and this is the thing I never quite understood, right? So this guy came to Microsoft to design mice and keyboards. That's what he was doing. And so how he went from what? that to creating a computer <laughs> and then convincing oh. Steven Sanofsky that this thing made sense. And then Steven Sanofsky going to Balmer and the board and being rejected multiple times before they all finally agreed it was the right idea and it wasn't, but whatever is one of those crazy stories that, I mean, just, I, I'm, I feel like there's a crucial detail I'm missing some, some insight, some, you know, that, that he has this capability or skill that I'm not aware of that I, you know, but um, uh, for him, you know, okay. So we run surface. It's okay. It's a hardware line. It's kind of a small thing. Um, obviously very controversial when they first came out with it. Um, but when he took over Windows, I, 
I just, you know, bringing that amount, that type of, or his style, uh, how do I say this? I'm trying to be diplomatic here. It was kind of form over function, frankly. Yeah. Um, I often joke uh, with this, uh, with Sachin and Adela, which is really unfair because he's an engineer and a very smart person. But I, I would joke about him that if you took one of his speeches and put it into Word and had Word condense it down to a synopsis, it would come up with nothing because there was nothing said. And I really feel like that was kind of what Panay was all about. He was, um, he never really said anything of substance and never really did anything of substance. And I think you could be very critical objectively of all the boats that surface missed, all the technologies they let slip, the every single time came up with a last uh, generation processor right as a new one was coming out. Do you think those and were his decisions? He led the group. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there were um, uh, factors that contributed to this uh, pricing, you know, uh, cost structures that he's, you know, he had, you know, couldn't do anything about it, I'm sure. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, that's a, I big, just, a big battleship that, you know, it's hard so, to. I don't know if yeah. one man can Our, control it. I mean, all I know about him was his presentations. So I, which, I have okay, no what, idea. What's your take on his presentations? Well, they were style? Like, they what, were dopey. They were terrible. We always made fun weird, of weird, right? And yeah. I, I think it was just he was trying to be Steve Jobs, and he wasn't. Uh, this uh, I, we're so far past the point anyone should be trying that. Well, I understand I, I just, that, but I, I wouldn't I judge right, his way, performance on that. I mean, that's okay. That's okay because that's not his real job. Is he wasn't hired as a presenter? He was hired to run, well, but except that he was hardware. <laughs> Oh. Right. Well, not originally, right? But he was, but that became his role. Like, in other words, this was a thing I had talked to Terry Myerson about, right? The, um, you know, when you lead a group uh, at Microsoft and you're going to, um, your group is going to present some information, that person wants to do that, <laughs> right? They don't want to give it away to underlings because, God forbid, that goes over really well. And then that underling is viewed as being more important and maybe they get promoted over you and that kind of thing. And so this is like a, a weird political thing that absolutely, you know, is a thing. But the, I think the thing people need to sort of understand about Microsoft and public presentations is that they have a business inside of Microsoft that teaches executives and other people how to speak publicly. And it is a grueling ongoing process. And there is no end to it unless you're really good at it. And um, I have to think that this was like uh, someone forcing him to do homework on weekends every time because he was he just never got good at it. You know, Terry... Myerson started off very poorly, I would say, from a public presentation perspective, but then he, you know, he got better over time. And that's usually what happens to people when they have more experience, you know, and I, I look, it's hard. I've, I was always terrible at public presentations, but my key skill, if I, you know, if I have to point one out is that I was good at the off the cuff stuff. So Q and a, that kind of thing, you know, if something went wrong, you could just keep talking. Right. And he was just the exact opposite of that. And, uh, and I just found that weird. I, most people who, well, most people who are on stage that much <laughs> want to be there and do develop skills. And I, I, I always found his whole thing to be very strange. Um, but, you know, personally, I would just say um, the other thing that those people that ran Windows had in common was that they understood where I was coming from. And what I mean by that is that critical uh, feedback, right, is constructive. And it comes from a place literally of love, meaning I love the product. I love the people that use it. I want this thing to be good. And I always kind of compared it to, um, you know, my kid comes home with a bad report card and uh, I still love the kid, but I'm still going to yell at him and we're still going to punish that kid. And that is one way to show love in a way, right? Because we want that kid in this case to do the best that they can do and they weren't doing it. And um, I never, I very clearly, in fact, I know explicitly that was not the case with Panos Panay. He did not understand that. And uh, Stephen Sanofsky had this problem actually uh, at times. Um, the, any criticism was just, it was an us versus you mentality and and uh, whatever. My my first interaction with Steve, with um, Panos Panay was just as awkward and weird as my first one with Stephen Sanofsky. Um, when I first met Stephen Sanofsky, it was after he had emailed me for the very first time because I had leaked something about some future version of Office uh, and asked me to take it down, which I did for a time. And when I met him uh, at the next Office event, because he was you know, speaking, I walked up to him and uh, he was talking to a couple of guys. It was a lull in the conversation. I said, Stephen, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Paul Therott. And he literally just looked at me and he looked me up and down and then he turned back and just kept talking. Uh, and it didn't acknowledge me in any way, shape or form. But I was like, okay, here we go. Oh, um, the first time I met Panos Panay, he was coming to Boston 
And I got a, someone from PR reached out and said, Hey, can you meet with him at the Boston store? And I said, sure. Then, you know, they had the Microsoft store then. And so I went in and, um, <laughs> they were, I thought we were going to sit out oh, there tables and things. And he's like, uh, no, no, we're going out back. And uh, we went into this kind of bar back dark room with no windows. It was way in the back of the store and someone closed the door and it was just me and him. And he said, and I, I, this was right either after surface two had launched or it was just about to launch. And I had received a mother load of leaks about this product. I fully leaked it to the world, whatever, it, it, everything. The only thing I got wrong was I thought the, it was white. It was just an off color photo. It was gray. You know, the machine was not black anymore, but I had the whole, everything, all the specs, all the pictures, all the, whatever. And, um, he demanded to know, uh, who had given me this information, which I said, I don't know if you can demand, you know but works, you're, uh, you're never going to you know, give it to him. Yeah. I'm like, that's not how that works. I, I can't do my that. Sources. He was, he was, he was positive. I was going to give him this information. And I just thought, man, this no. is a really weird way to get off, uh, uh, you know, to get on with this guy. Huh. Yeah. So I eventually just sort of said, so I'll be serious. That was the point of the meeting right? was for him. Yeah. To... That's all he wanted. That's what he wanted me to rat on whoever it was. What an ass. And I was just like, man, dude, <laughs> like, this is sorry. And, uh, no, the answer was no. So I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I guess the to find one quote was pretty good from somebody. Um, do you think he, <laughs> he didn't like you from that point on? Yeah. Yeah. I think he saw me as adversarial, you know, um, I well, think he was the reason know. I didn't get a bunch of the devices for review. Yeah. I mean, there I were petty little things like with Apple as well. I mean, I, that's our job. Yeah. Our job is not to be a cheerleader for. A, I mean, a company. I'm not patting myself on the back, but when it comes to like Windows PC reviews, I think I'm pretty good. You yeah, know, and, and I do pretty a bunch well of known, and you're significant in the I think field. So, so you know, I, look again. I, I you know, but but you know, after Surface Pro three, well, I don't know. Maybe it was after Surface. Pro for, you know, the whole surface gate thing, which I coined that term and I am sure he did not like that. Um, I've been very critical of the leadership at surface, meaning him, frankly, and their decisions and well, the no ignoring USB-C no, for so many years. No wonder he didn't no, but, like you. But that's not. Well, yeah, yes and no. But yes and no, job. right? In I mean, other words, where am I coming from? Like, here's a, here's an idea. Have a discussion with me, you know? Um, I, so just to give you an idea of a, the difference between like meetings you might have in private with someone like that. One year I was going to CES and Microsoft did not have, uh, no longer had presence there. And this is um, the year before Microsoft announced, uh, the year probably that Microsoft announced Windows S mode or Windows 10 S, whatever. So I got to reach out. Someone said, hey, uh, Terry wants to meet you at the whatever, blah, wherever it is. And I went into this, it was just me and him in a big room. We were talking and he was telling me that this thing that was called Windows 10 Cloud was coming and I told him this was a bad name. And he said, yep, no, we, we we're going to change the name. Everyone agrees it's terrible. Name. <laughs> but then he told me about how uh, they were going to charge for it and that, it, but that if anybody, no, they, they were going to charge for it, but only for like, you know, after a certain period of time, like two or three months or something. And I was like, oh, I said, that's not a good idea. And, uh, you know, he's like, why? And I said, well, you know, <laughs> I, had, I just checked into my terrible hotel last night coming here to Vegas. I got in the middle of the night, stood in line for 40 minutes with so many people waiting to check in. And then I get up there and I look at my bill and it's literally twice what they said it was going to be because I booked it through Expedia like a jerk. And I said, how come this bill is so expensive? And it was all like, you know, all these extra fees. And it's like that little, it's like that gotcha moment is what yeah, I call it's it. resort fees. And I, and, and, and yeah, I said, that's yeah. what you're doing to customers. I said, yeah. you know, you're giving them this crappy version of Windows and then they want to switch to the real thing. And it's a gotcha moment. Like yeah. they're going to pay another 50 bucks. And I will never forget this moment. I've told the story in writing at least, but he, you know, we were in a conference room. So he, he leaned back in his chair, so he was almost parallel to the ground, and he, st he was staring up at the ceiling. And he—I won't say it, but he it was like f-word. But he—he he drew it out like, like over like you know ten seconds. And I'm like, Terry, come on! I can't be the first person that came up with this idea. Like this is, you know, whatever. But anyway, they changed it, and the way they changed it was they extended the time, and then they secretly said, "We're never going to charge anybody. Like we're just—we're not going to charge for this because it would be that gotcha moment, right? You could do that, or you could do what Panos did, which was to slowly cut me out of the thing. Like, he would do petty things like. Um, bunch of devices would come out and he would only let me review the really cheap little thing instead of, you know, the nice one or whatever. And it's like, dude, I, this is not my audience. I, you know, my audience isn't buying the toy. They're getting the, you know, the enterprise device. So I just, uh, there was that. And then, uh, you know, there are people who, um, you know, obviously is my opinion uh, biased in some way? Yeah, probably. Right. But, uh, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> I've dealt with a lot of these people. I've never seen anything quite like him. There uh, is and a, one guy. This uh, is a pet peeve of mine, which is uh, it's happening yeah. across the tech industry uh, because of the 
in this is a little inside baseball, folks. I apologize, yeah. but because but you should know because you should consider this when you look at reviews because of the rise of the influencer in in the and particularly in YouTube, but TikTok and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, these companies have realized, oh, you know these you know these guys have millions of views. Yeah. Whether they I have know. the influence, I don't know, but they have millions of views, and they're right. much more amenable because they're not mm -hmm. journalists. They're much <laughs> more right. amenable to much more. stroking right. and let's you know take a the, picture um, and all that stuff. And I, so as I, a result, they don't want to deal with you. Right. Because you're they don't not want to, or, We, we so can just nice. be praised all the time. Well, let's just do that. You know, I don't think that's healthy, by the way. And but, I mean well, that on for many, many users. levels. Because we, it's all, but it's all, it now is, they're yeah. getting their information yeah. from people who have effectively been suborned. You they're know what, not, though? I would say... This is bad for the company, it's bad for the product, and it's bad for that person who made that decision, including the leader of that business, because this is everyone knows this. It's simple, right? You don't just listen to yes men. You you gotta you have to have people pushing back saying, hold on a second, this isn't right. Especially when it's coming, like I said, from a place, the right place. I call it a place of love, but it's a a place of constructive criticism. I care about this stuff. Like I want it to be as good as well, it can it's not be. apparent that Microsoft listens to users either. I hate to say it, but <laughs> yeah, well, listen, this is my lifelong struggle. So, <laughs> I'm Jason Howell. How do you thank your hardworking team? Well, with a Club Twit corporate subscription, of course. You can show your appreciation and reward your tech team with a subscription to Club Twit, and that way they'll be informed and entertained with podcasts covering the latest in technology. With a Club Twit subscription, they're going to get access to all of our podcasts ad free the members-only Discord, exclusive outtakes, behind-the-scenes and special content, and exclusive shows like Hands-On Mac, Hands-On Windows, and The Untitled Linux Show. Go to twit.tv slash clubtwit and look for corporate plans for complete details.